Good to see you tonight. <clears throat> Hope you're able to hear me okay. It doesn't seem to be a lot of volume to it, but anyhow, we're going to worship the Lord and sing together 440. <coughs> 440. It is a, a hymn that expresses a desire of heart. It's a prayer. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Teach me thy way. Thy gracious aid of four, teach me thy way. Help me to walk aright more by faith, less by sight. Lead me with heavenly light. Teach me thy way. Thank you. You have to sing out extra well tonight. There's a number of people away uh, on other business, some across the water and uh, other things that they have to go to. So you've got to sing up tonight. Uh, not too much, but just, just a wee bit more. Thank you. Stand to see. Teach me thy way, O oh Lord, teach me thy way, thy grace is tonight has commenced with this expression of heart, this desire of soul, this prayer indeed that has been upon our lips in song, teach me thy way. Not a time that we come to a meeting like this, or a Sabbath day, or privately to your word, but it's the kind of prayer that we need to offer, one to be taught of the Lord, one to be directed by thee. And so from the beginning as we approach thee now, through the Lord Jesus, we come to stand upon his redemptive work. We pray that you will abide with us tonight, that you will speak to us, that you will teach us the things out of your precious word that we need to know. Things that will be helpful as we study again the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, we want to, to know more and more about him and his ministry in our lives. Thank thee for these studies, and Lord, you have been teaching us. We pray that you'll bless your people. Thank thee for all that have gathered to the prayer meeting tonight, and the desire in their heart to meet with God, to spend time in fellowship, the one with the other. Thank thee for those of like precious faith, our brethren, our sisters here in Christ. They're part of the greater family of God, we know that. Thank you for the things that we have in common, the things that we enjoy together. We can say in the words of the hymn writer, we've been to Jesus for the cleansing power. We're washed in the blood of the Lamb. We thank you, Lord, that our sins are gone. We've been brought into union with Christ. We're joined to him forever. We can say, I am my beloved's, and my beloved's is mine, and his banner over me is love. 
We thank thee for that bond that there is between those that are, are grafted into the vine. O oh Lord, we praise thee that our great union is with Christ first and foremost as the head of the church. But then we are united the one to the other in the body of Christ, members one of another as your word tells us. Help us, Lord, to function well. Help us to do our part for thee. We know that when every part of the body, the human body, is working well, then the body is healthy. And how true it is in the church that when every member is functioning well, doing their bit for the Lord, then it's a healthy spiritual body. And we want that to be so. Bless us in our outreach work, in our endeavor to win others to Christ. May we be faithful in the lives that we live, in the words that we say. May we have that winsomeness about us as we seek to woo men to the cross and bring them to know Christ as their Savior. We pray that you will multiply conversions in this very town and further afield. That there might be a great ingathering unto Christ in these days. So bless us tonight as we further wait on before thee. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's a warm word of welcome that we give to you at this part of the service tonight and those that are listening uh, with us on the internet. Welcome in Jesus' name. The subject tomorrow evening at the Youth Fellowship is the distinctives of the Free Presbyterian Church and it's part two. And then on Saturday morning the open air at 11, God willing. Uh, the weather wasn't very favorable last Saturday but we're hoping that it'll be better uh, this coming Saturday. Then the Lord's Day begins with the prayer meeting at 8 o'clock, Sabbath school at 10.30, the Bible class at 10.30. And our worship service at 12 noon, we come to our meditations from Mark. And then in the evening it's the remembrance service and the wreath laying ceremony. And that's at 7. Thank you for your tithes and offerings and giving to the work of God. A vision magazine, we just remind you, is available. And we are encouraging you to get Dr. Kearns' book, In Memory of God's Dear Servant. We have this new book, a uh, book of daily Bible readings. The paper pulpit is also available. I'm not sure if you got round to this, but it needs to be done pretty soon so that we can get the order in to the Reverend Macmillan. And if you're looking some copies for uh, giving out to others, means of evangelism, well then, please do uh, put your name on the list in the many copies you'd like. Running through very quickly because we want you to keep this in mind and in prayer. The Carmichael School in Pakistan, the Sunday School class there, the Freya runs in another part, the Thara Tara Sewing Centre, and then our brother John as he conducts Bible studies and gives out the Word of God, which he has been doing in recent days, and the food distribution and sharing the Gospel with those that he comes into contact with. We continue to pray for the orphan children that we're supporting. I had an opportunity, uh, that's the Pankers group, just on Sunday, just let me mention that. Every Sunday there's this little group now meeting together, and his father-in-law is the pastor of the work, but uh, the Panker is doing a lot of the preaching. But on Wednesday past, there was another little group of orphan children I was asked to speak to, and we had the opportunity to do that. And we just brought them the four dimensions of the love of God, from John chapter 3 and verse 16. Those were matters for prayer. I want to mention to you tonight what we were able to uh, just outline last Sunday, and that's the, the Christmas dinner. It's on the 3rd of December. That's Friday night, the 3rd of December, and you'll see this sheet will be at the door as you go out. You can begin to fill your name in, and the menu is turkey and ham, very seasonal, or if you don't want that, you can have uh, the beef choice. And that will be served with spaghetti, with asparagus, leeks, mint, and chives. And, uh, oh, sorry, that's the vegetarian meal. Yes, indeed. Uh, so that's a very interesting one. I'm glad I'm a carnivore. Um, but if you're not, there's spaghetti for you with a bit of asparagus and leeks and whatever else that is there. So anyhow, uh, the price is £20, pounds, um, and there's a wee place just to, to tick your name. So if you're an adult, 
there's turkey and there's beef and if you want the, the vegetable tick there as well uh, if you are a, a young child I'm trying to remember the age but as a young young child you want one of those meals that's maybe sausages and chips or uh, a burger or a chicken goujons you can have that and the price is 5.95 if you are an older child 12 and up or 13 and up I think it might be and you want a half Christmas dinner maybe that's for any child wouldn't it be for any child but uh, but you prefer the Christmas dinner then uh, the price is 10 pounds all our seniors uh, we've done this in the past you go free so if you're a senior citizen you get it for nothing and our young people from the youth fellowship they get it at half price as a wee encouragement because we're not able to have your Christmas dinner for you is that everything Samuel I to say about that is, is as clear as it will be for now if there's any amendment to make we'll do that let's sing the hymn it's another hymn keeping with the theme tonight about guidance and being directed by the Lord <coughs> guide me O thy great Jehovah pilgrim through this barren land I am weak but thou art mighty hold me with thy powerful hand bread of heaven feed me till I want no more Let's stand the suit. God be all the great King of the pilgrim through this barren land. I am we, but thou art mighty. installation done the better my, my wife who rarely misses this meeting she's got some babysitting duties I was just listening in and uh, she's able to send me a text nice solo <laughs> it's probably a solo I'm not too sure if the other word of description fits the solo or not uh, but there you go speed the day whenever it's the congregation you hear in the main let's turn to Acts chapter 13 Acts 13 I want to read the opening five verses Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul as they ministered to the Lord and fasted 
The Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. May the Lord bless the reading of this passage of scripture to every one of us tonight. We know that we're doing this study, the wonderful ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. We come to message 8 and we come to our 10th uh, thought on this subject, He Directs. And if we're to use a text tonight, and there's many we could use, I would suggest to use the second verse, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. We were to prayer. In the stillness of this moment, we seek thee again in prayer, as ever it is our desire that the Lord will speak. We come to a meeting like this or any other meeting and we leave the same way. It's, it's vanity. But Lord, we want to come to every meeting on a Thursday night, on the Lord's day, whatever it might be, and hear from heaven. Be taught of God. And we open up the word to know that, that the Lord is speaking. He has a word for us. So help us to give our hearts to the things of the Lord tonight. Our attention, our minds. Lord, we just give ourselves to thee now. And we pray that you'll come powerfully, effectually, and work in our hearts. And speak to all that are here. And may we leave with a testimony in our minds and our hearts and upon our lips. We met with God and he spoke to me. Give me help to bring the message tonight. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Am I looking for guidance? Am I praying about God's will for my life? Am I seeking the way ahead in the pilgrimage of this world? I want to know about the future. I want to know maybe even about employment. Or more importantly, the service of Christ. If you feel that the Lord has given you a burden in your heart for his work. Where do we go? What do we do? How do I know that the right path to follow? How can I discern the will of God? Who, who will tell me? Well, God has not left us to ourselves. He has not given us over to our own imaginations or perceptions to do what we think or what we feel or even desire. Thank God he has given to us a guide. Remember Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. God has ever been the guide of his people. Old Testament and New Testament. Let me just run through a few scriptures with you uh, to underscore this at the very beginning. And I would turn your attention to the Psalm 25, first of all, and verse 9. Speaking about the Lord's people here under the, the symbol of the meek. The meek will he guide in judgment. The meek will he teach his way. So you mark the words guide there and teach. This is the Lord working, operating in your life and in mine. We turn over a number of pages to the Psalm 48. And I want you to mark verse 14. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide. And I'm glad about the last little part of the phrase here. Even unto death. Right to the end of the journey. God has promised to be our guide. Go over to the Psalm 73. And Mark verse 24. <clears throat> Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Let me give you a few examples from the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 21. I love this verse. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it when ye turn to the right hand 
and when you turn to the left. It's always a special thing when God comes that way, isn't it? And you hear, as it were, this, this prompting, this directing of the Lord. This is the way that I want you to go. We turn a few pages to chapter 42 of this prophecy and we mark verse 18, 16. <clears throat> I will bring the blind by a way they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. What a blessing that is in the midst of the darkness of this world. God directing, God guiding, God showing the way. That darkness that is often there being made light to us. Those crooked paths that are so often before us being made straight by the Lord. And the Lord again just simply showing us the way. Can I show you one other verse and that's chapter 48 and verse 17. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God which teacheth thee to profit which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. It should ever be our prayer that God will direct our path, that he will show us the way, that he will lead us plainly in this world, that he will tell us what to do and where to go. Indeed, that he will whisper those words. This is the way, walk ye in it. Here's the cry of the Lord's people. If you want a prayer uh, to offer unto the Lord. You might pray along the lines of Psalm 5 and verse 8. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. Or you might think of the Psalm 25 and verse 5. For in the time of trouble he shall guide me. He shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon uh, a rock, that's the wrong verse I'm reading that's chapter 27 as you will know lead me, chapter 25 verse 5, lead me in thy truth and teach me we're thinking about a prayer now that you might bring to the Lord as you're seeking for guidance on the way ahead now we come to chapter 27 but it's verse 11 teach me thy way O Lord, lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies, you could use any of these texts as a prayer, as you're looking for guidance and wisdom. Israel of old was directed by the Lord. You remember way back in Exodus chapter 13, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. We're told in chapter 13, verse 21, that the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. So constantly, whether it was in the darkness or in the light, there was that pillar, the visible presence of God directing the way of the children of Israel. And God's people today are still directed. I want you to know that for you and me in this modern day. Now, not by pillars of fire and cloud or by any other visible manifestation of God's presence, but by the Holy Spirit of God in our lives, in our hearts. And he primarily, as we shall see tonight, uses the Word of God. You'll be reading through your daily devotions. You will be sitting maybe in the house of God on the Lord's Day. And as the Word of God is read and expounded, the Lord will have a message for you. The Holy Spirit will impress some scripture upon your heart and you will know that God is speaking through it. This is still part of the ministry of the Spirit of God today. To guide us, to teach us, to lead us, instruct us, to open up the Word of God and show us the way that we ought to walk. Now we're going to look at the example before us that we read tonight in Acts chapter 13 where we have the, uh, the history of Paul and Barnabas, or Saul and Barnabas, always keep in mind that he had two names. There are those who say that he got a name change. He didn't get a name change. In the earlier part of the history, he's called Saul, which was his Jewish name. But when he went to be uh, the great missionary to the Gentile world, 
he assumed his other name, his Roman name, his Gentile name, which was Paul. So he had both names. Um, he's introduced, of course, as Saul of Tarsus to us. But we discover here in the history of Paul and Barnabas that they are ordained as missionaries. And they're, they're sent forth by the church. We're going to see how this happened. And how that it was the directive of the Holy Spirit of God. Clearly and unmistakably directing the leadership of the church at Antioch in this very matter. You and I will have similar experiences as we seek the Lord. As we uh, wait upon him. As we look to him for whatever the guidance is that you're desiring from him. The Lord will come and he will direct our way. I want you to notice first of all the message that was given to uh, the disciples by the Spirit of God. And we have it there at the end of verse 2. Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. You see it's God that appoints his ministers. It is God that appoints his missionaries, his leaders, his workers. We do not believe in self-appointment. Just setting ourselves forward. Now that's different when you volunteer for a work and you feel the, the, the promptings of the Holy Spirit. But really above it all, before it all, there's one above who is directing our way. It is the Spirit of God as we see here in Acts chapter 13 who calls the Christian to a special work. Perhaps you're asking the question tonight, it could be somewhere here in this meeting, maybe in the heart of a young person, shall I go to Spain? Shall I go to Africa? Maybe there to, to work in Emmanuel School in, in Uganda? Or maybe to Kenya where there's a need of, of missionaries or some other part of, of Africa? Or Lord, should I, should I go to Asia? Asia's beginning to open up. Or should I go to Australia? Lord, do you want me to go into the ministry? Do you want me to be a missionary? Do you want me to be an evangelist? Do you want me to get involved in some kind of full-time service? You cannot rightly settle this question for yourself. And it's true to say neither can any other person rightly settle this for you. They can't tell you this is the Lord's will for your life. Not every Christian is called to such a work. God alone knows whether or not he desires an individual to serve him in, in such a capacity. But he's willing to show you, as he did with Paul and with Barnabas, and very importantly here at the church, as they are directed by the Spirit of God on this occasion. By the way, it's very interesting, I believe, and instructive, that Paul received the call of God many years previously. Indeed, at his conversion experience. And you go back to Acts chapter 9 where we read about Saul of Tarsus getting converted. You remember the Lord had a disciple living in the city of Damascus called Ananias. And he told Ananias, I want you to go to the street that is called Straight. And I want you to speak to this man called Saul of Tarsus. And I want you to give him a message from me. This man that you're going to speak to, and this is what the Lord said to Ananias, is a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. This was the future work that the apostle was going to be involved in. And Paul himself spoke about this many, many years later when he stood before King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. How that Jesus had appeared to him all those years ago on the Damascus road and told him, I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and witness. And he told him that he would send them to the Gentiles to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Now though Paul began to preach Christ immediately, when he was saved, he had good knowledge with his background, with all his studies, and he would out, you remember, and he preached Christ to the inhabitants of the city of Damascus. And he was a witness for the Lord. This special work of being a missionary was not realized for many, many years. In fact, it's something like 10 years later 
when you come to Acts chapter 13. But those years were important. They were preparation years. God was getting his child ready for the great work that he was being called to. Here in Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit is directing the disciples. Separate me. And so here's the message that was given to these men. The great need in, the, in Christian work today is men and women whom the Holy Spirit calls and sends forth. Then they have gone forward without a call and in most of the cases it hasn't worked out very well. In some cases it's been a disaster. We want the Spirit of God to direct the way of our young people and older people too. You're never too old to get into the Lord's work. We want the Spirit of God to direct the church as well as he did here in Acts chapter 13. The elders of the church that they can discern when a young person comes forward and presents themselves for missionary work. We want the elders to be able to discern that call. And then maybe later on the mission board who will then on behalf of Presbytery send young people to the various parts of the world to which they have been called. Now sometimes the message might be a negative one that the Lord gives. Turn for a moment to Acts chapter 16. And notice what we read in verses 6 and 7. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia. And were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. So here the Lord is stepping in. Here the Spirit of God is stepping in. And he's now forbidding them to go to this particular region, Asia. Verse 7. After they were come to Mysia. They assayed or desired to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not, or permitted them not. The Spirit of God stood in the way of them going to that particular region. So sometimes the message might be to, to step in and say, no, you're not to go to this place. God opens doors. As we've seen with our missionaries who have gone to the mission field, he opens doors that no man can shut. But sometimes God shuts the door. He closes the door. And he certainly did it with these men. And then let me say that what is true of Christian work. A call to the mission field. Or a call to be a minister. Or a call to some other kind of full time service. Is also true of our daily lives. And everything that we do. I want you to know that, dear child of God. You may never be a minister. You may never be a missionary. You may never come into the Lord's work in this sense in a full-time capacity. But still in your life, you want the guidance of God. You want the Holy Spirit to direct your way. And so we should be looking to the Lord to, for the leading and the guiding of the Spirit in the details of any decision that we take in life, especially the major ones. There are major decisions to take. You can know the will of God concerning your education. Young people are making decisions all the time about further education. They're sent to primary school, uh, they graduate on into some form of high school, and then they get to a place, whether they go on to do their A-levels or follow some other vocation or eventually go to university. You want to know the mind of God? Young people, even in education, it's important. And you want to know the mind of God when it comes to employment, in your secular employment, that what you do in life, this is what God wants you to do. You certainly want to know the mind of God if you're going to step into marriage, that this is the way that you are to go, this is the person that you are to marry. Or moving house might surprise you how a few Christians really pray when they are thinking about moving house. That they, they don't pray, is this the will of God? Is this where the Lord wants me to be? And some of them may even emigrate to other countries. And they never take the mind of God or the will of God into consideration. They don't pray for the guidance of the Spirit. And sometimes it has worked out disastrously. Because they've taken themselves and they've taken their family Maybe to some part where there isn't even a church where they can worship together. And it hasn't worked out very well for the family. 
And you want to know the mind of God, even what church that you want to, to join and be a member of. It is possible to have the unerring guidance of the Spirit at every turn of life. Where you should go and what you should do. If you take personal work for an example, we are to be witnesses. We, all of us are to be witnesses, by the way. In the Old Testament, God says, ye are my witnesses. In the New Testament, Jesus, to his disciples, he said also that they were to be witnesses in Jerusalem and further afield, as we know from Acts 1 and verse 8. We ought to pray that God will open doors and send us to individuals. Individuals that the Lord wants us to speak to. You know, you can't speak to everybody that you meet with. That's just impossible. And there are some to whom we perhaps ought not to speak because we're really going to waste our time and it's going to end nowhere. Time spent on them would be taken away from more profitable and valuable time speaking to somebody else. So we want to know the mind of God. Doubtless, Philip met many as he journeyed towards Gaza before he met the one whom the Spirit said to him, Go near and join myself to this chariot, the Ethiopian eunuch. Took his journey towards Gaza. There were other people on that route traveling that day. But there was one that the Lord had prepared. There was a special person that the Lord wanted Philip to witness to. And so the Spirit is ready to guide you and me also. The second point tonight is the the manner in which this message came. Look at our text again, verse 2. And just mark the little phrase here. The Holy Ghost said. It must be asked, how did this message come? How was it communicated? How was it presented and conveyed to the disciples? How did the Spirit of God bring this message to these men here in Acts chapter 13? We must not forget that the work of the prophetic ministry was still in operation in those days of the apostles. God was still speaking audibly to his servants. We have a very clear example of that back in chapter 10 and verse 19 and 20 in the case of Peter. While Peter thought on the vision, this vision that God gave to him, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Here's the words that were given directly by the Spirit of God to Peter. It wasn't just an impression in his heart. It wasn't just some kind of prompting for him to go. No, we're clearly told that the Spirit said. The Spirit of God spoke to him in an audible fashion. Now when the Spirit came to his apostles and teachers in Acts chapter 13, it was either through the lips of the prophets, like we have in chapter 11 and verse 28, we read about a man called Agabus, and there stood up this, this prophet, and he signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. So here God is speaking through a prophet. God had already communicated the message to the prophet. The prophet now is the one that speaks to the other. So here in chapter 13, it either came like that or it came by a still small voice into the ears of each man or to that group that were assembled there like we have back in Acts chapter 8 and verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And there was that whisper in the ear of Philip as he was making his journey that day. This is the way of walking. Go join thyself to this chariot. The Holy Spirit is the invisible but the ever-present representative of Jesus Christ. Whom Christ promised to send as a teacher and a guide to his church after he himself had withdrawn his bodily presence. So when the Lord was on earth with these men, with the disciples, he was able to speak to them directly. But he ascended into glory 
that physical presence of Christ was gone, but he sent the Comforter, he sent the Holy Spirit, one of the same kind, and the Lord does not speak audibly any longer. Rather, he speaks through his word. There is an important passage I want you to turn to in Hebrews chapter 1, just those opening verses, in fact, verses 1 and 2. Just take a moment to to find the place. It says, God, who at sundry times and in divers or various manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That's how God spoke in times past. That's clear. But look at verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now this is an important text. God spoke at various times in various ways to through his prophets, through his prophets and through his prophets in Old Testament times. Who then spoke, brought the message to the people or to the leaders. However, in these last days, we're told very clearly here in Hebrews chapter 1, he speaks by his son. I want to remind you that Christ is the message of God to this world. And where do we read about Christ? In this book that is before us. Jesus Christ has given this book. It's the written word of God. Jesus Christ is the incarnate word. This Bible that we have before us is the written word of God. And the Lord has given it to us. God has a finished revelation now. I want you to see that. There's nothing more can be added. You know, if somebody came and they said, They had a dream from God or they had a word from God and God spoke these words directly to them. You could put it into the Bible because that's the words of God. But God's word's complete. He's nothing more to add. In fact, we're warned in the scriptures that we're not to add to what God has already given. The canon of scripture, as we called it, is settled and sealed in the 66 books that we have here. There are no new revelations. There are no new discoveries. There are no new communications. We have a complete revelation of the will of God. And you're holding it tonight in your hands. Here is where the Holy Spirit of God speaks. In God's word. If I desire direction. If I want to know the will of God. The Spirit of God will direct me. How will he do that? Through the scriptures. He will lay into my heart. A strong conviction concerning his will and his purpose. As I meditate upon this book. That's what I need to do. Lord, show me the way. Guide me. Come to his word. As I read the scriptures, God will give me the answers that I need. And the Holy Spirit will apply that answer to my mind and my heart as I read the word of God. It's a very godly family that lived a number of years ago. Some of you actually will, will know the Mung sisters. And uh, many of them went into the Lord's work of various kinds. Some of them went to the mission field, etc. And there's a conversation held, and I can't, maybe some of you can uh, prompt me in this, but there was a conversation held between two of them. One of them was in hospital. It might have been Emma or Janet. And they were in hospital with a leg infection. And such was the the extent of that infection that an amputation had to be done. That was the verdict of the the consultant. The leg had to come off. And so one day the sister who was at home came up to visit the one that was in hospital. And as the dear child of God lay in bed and her sister came into the, the ward, into the room, she said, have you got a word today from the Lord for me? And her sister says, yes. I was just meditating on the Psalm 121 and the Lord really impressed it upon my heart. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He said, well, you know, it's my leg has to come off, not my foot. Her sister said, don't think the Lord will remove your leg and not take your foot away as well. <laughs> they were humorous. But you know, those, those ladies took that as a word from God that God had spoken. 
He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. The amputation does not need to take place. And they prayed about it and they left it there. And the leg got better. And the amputation didn't need to take place. The Lord spoke through his word. I remember well how the Holy Spirit led me through the word of God as I was thinking about my future. In fact, in those major decisions that I've taken in my life, I sought God about my, my ministry. I was a young teenager growing up in the Portadown Church and a lot of young people in those days and many of them the Lord was dealing with and sending to Bible college and into missionary work, into full-time service of, of various kinds. I had this great impression upon my heart in those days. I would like to be a children's worker. Noel Stevenson had made a great impression upon me and I thought maybe this is what the Lord would have me to do. I applied to the Whitfield College of the Bible I was sure in my heart that God had called me to full-time service. And my thought was maybe it would be like a, a full-time evangelist to children. When I went for the interview, and we were accepted for the two-year course as it was in those days, the interview panel challenged me about praying for the, the ministry, which I did. I went home and led it before the Lord for a number of weeks and got no answer. And I just felt maybe I should give up. But I was at a special event. I think it was in the Park Avenue Hotel and they were celebrating 30 years of the Free Presbyterian Church. And that night there was a panel of speakers and one of them put out a particular challenge to young people about going into the ministry. And I felt, Lord, I'll pray about this again. And I made it a matter of special prayer. I was reading through the words of Paul to young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. And I was asking, Lord, do you want me to go into the ministry? Do you want me to become a minister in the church? And I read in this verse, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. The Lord was speaking to me as I was praying about this matter. I went on to the next chapter, chapter 2 and verse 7, whereunto I am ordained a preacher. And I knew that I could not be a minister. I could not be ordained as a preacher unless I did the theological course for the four years at the Whitfield College of the Bible. And I actually started at Bible College. I told the principal of the burden that I had just as I came to college. And he said, you start attending the theological lectures and I'll arrange an interview with the presbytery. And he did. And well, the rest is history. But I was sure in my heart God wanted me to go in to the ministry. I can remember then praying about my future when I came out of college. I had been a student minister in, in Adara uh, for two and a half years. So I I'd finished the college in the June of 1985. And uh, we stayed in the work of Adara until the end of that year, the Christmas time. But... It wasn't the constituted work. They couldn't call me as the minister and my time came to an end. They began to search out my heart concerning the future. Where does the Lord want me to be? There was a church in Northern Ireland had got together, the seven committee men, they didn't have elders, but they had met together and they had asked me, they said, listen, we are of a mind, we would like to put it to the church to call you as our minister. And I said, well, I've actually been asked to go to England for a month the month of February. And whenever I'm away, I'll pray about it, I'll seek the Lord about it. But you know, when I was in um, England, the Lord began to burden my heart for the work there in Open Broad. And during that time when I was there, I believe the Lord spoke to me very, very clearly. And he did so through Nehemiah, again through my, my daily devotions in Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 7. Thou art the Lord, the God who didst choose Abram and broughtest him forth out of the air of the Chaldees and gavest him the name of Abraham. And so I could see very clearly here the Lord was bringing a man out of his country. And I felt that God was speaking to me then. No, don't stay in Northern Ireland at that stage. Go to England. So it was clear in my mind and heart that this verse was for me. The Lord spoke to me on the 13th of the 2nd. 1986. I have it marked somewhere in my Bible. And then I sought the Lord about 
uh, the church in Porto Vogue. Uh, we had been in England for about four years. There was something very strange that happened for the first time ever and the only time that I ever remember I took the flu. You know, people say I have the flu, uh, but it's really a bad cold or it's a man flu. Okay. But it was the flu. If you have the flu, it'll put you off your feet. And I, I, was, I liked that. Um, wasn't able to preach on the Thursday night. Wasn't able to preach on the Sunday. I'm almost sure about that. Yes, I'm almost sure. I'm certain about it. And my wife was at church, and we've got somebody else to stand in. And there was a man by the name of the Reverend Beggs who happened to visit Open Broad at that time. And uh, I, he was invited back to the house to have some supper with us that night after the evening service. And I can remember ha having a good conversation with the Lord's servant about this matter. And Well, he said, the Lord will lead you right. The Lord will, will show you clearly. And I, I knew that in my heart. And the Lord did speak. And he spoke through Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 6. The Lord, our God, spake unto us in Horeb, saying, Ye have dwelt long enough in this mount. And as I was praying about the matter and it came to this, I knew I had dwelt long enough where I was. And it was the mind of God for me to come back to Northern Ireland at that stage to Port of Ogie. And then what about Balamoney? Reverend Begg seemed to feature uh, in my life. He was the minister here or the interim moderator here uh, during the vacancy. And he rang me one Wednesday morning. I was sitting in my study in Port of Ogie. I was preparing a message for the prayer meeting that night. And the message was actually on Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. So that was sort of strange in my mind where Mr. Beggs relayed information to me that there was an interest expressed uh, here in Balamoney. So anyhow, we began to leave it before the Lord. And the Lord again spoke very clearly. And again, it was in Deuteronomy, this time chapter 2. And verse 3, ye have compassed this mountain long enough, turn you northward. But that money was up north. And then later on, another confirmation was in chapter 15 of Deuteronomy. And the opening verse, at the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. And I happen to be seven years in Port of Ogie. You was the mind of God to come here. I'm just sharing that personal word of testimony to show you as I sought the will of God looked to the Lord to direct my way for the Holy Spirit to show me this is the way walk in it. Where did I go? I went to the Bible, went to the word of God and in my daily devotions the Lord showed me clearly this is what I'm to do. Maybe you're praying tonight about your future. You're praying about the will of God. Here's the book to go to and the Lord will direct your way. I have one final little point to make this evening, and that is the ministry that the disciples were engaged in. And at the opening uh, part of verse 2, it says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, so, so on and so forth there. Now this is important. They, these men were engaged in spiritual activity. They were worshipping God here. They were worshipping God in prayer. They were worshipping God in exhortation. And also in fasting as, as we see. The occasion may have been a special day of prayer and fasting for these men. Whether it was just the church leaders by themselves or the membership of the whole body of God's people that were gathered on this occasion, we don't know. We're not certain. Or maybe it was just the five prophets and teachers that are mentioned here in the opening verse. It is likely that they have gathered to pray about the work of missionary endeavor. Very, very possible. The special commission and work that the Lord had called them to. And they're looking to the Lord about this matter. Carrying the gospel to the regions of the world as the Lord had commanded them. This had already been intimated to Saul at his conversion, you remember, back in chapter 9 and in verse 15. The Lord said to him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. 
It is as we we seek the Lord in prayer, as these men were seeking the Lord. And when necessary, fasting, if so exercised to do so. And through the ministry of the word, that's all happening here in Acts 13. That God will be pleased to come and make himself known and reveal his mind and reveal his, his will. As I said earlier, it may be through your daily devotions. It may be as you're sitting in a meeting like this or on the Lord's day. The word of God is opened and God will give you the answer that, that you need. If you're seeking the will of God and you're open and you're honest about this matter, the Holy Spirit will direct your path. And so I just encourage you tonight to seek him. As you read the scriptures, pray earnestly, Lord, direct me, show me your way. I believe in the methodical daily Bible reading. I don't believe that we should just open the Bible at random. I believe if you're looking for the mind of God, you you just carry on with your devotions and the portion of scripture that you're meditating and come to the next chapter. Maybe read on a little bit more until God speaks to you. But don't just open your Bible and do that there. It's not going to work. Not really. God will speak to you in your ordinary devotions as you seek him in prayer and he will direct your path because this is the ministry part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you and me he's the great guide and he will direct your paths in where you ought to be and what you ought to do be confident of that as you seek him may the Lord bless his word to all of our hearts we do have the, the sick and the needy of the congregation that we remember in prayer Take a wee look at the list there. It sometimes changes a little bit and there's some that are added to it and others are taken from it and some whose condition gets worse and we have to step up our prayers for them. I'll come to mention some specific matters of prayer when we get down to our time of prayer, but let's sing the chorus that we've been singing throughout this study. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh at me. Break me, melt me, mold me, fill me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. We stand to sing the sing it prayer for them. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. tuning in on the internet thank you uh, for being part of our service tonight we trust that you've been blessed we're going to come to our season of prayer now so we say farewell to you and we trust the lord will bless you indeed